I, w- I will record it. So, your recording and your sound, your slides will be available for all I three play membership. So we will we will we will have it on uh, Consumer Electronics Society website, and also we will have it on I three play website. Last time I used my desktop, and uh, I have very terrible uh, Right. So I can hear that some people are just coming. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we have so many people uh, uh, connecting from different places. Um, but in any way, uh, my name is uh, Wahab al muhtadi and uh, I am the uh, Vice President uh, Education of Consumer Electronic Society and I'm um, residing here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, today we have uh, the first uh, webinar that is organized uh, by Consumer Electronic Society and it is part of the uh, uh, education activities. And uh, we are lucky today that we have uh, one of the uh, DL speaker who was willing to uh, provide us with uh, a fantastic topic today that it is concerned to everybody. So I will just give uh, uh, a very brief description uh, or bio for, uh, for our speaker today. So. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anir Ban uh, Samgupta is working in the discipline of computer science and uh, engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Indore in India, where he directs the research lab on secured and reliable IP core design. He holds a PhD and Master of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Ryerson University, Toronto, Ontario, Canada and he's actually a registered professional engineer of Ontario, even if he is in India. Uh, in the past, he was uh, also affiliated with the Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore, as a visiting research scholar. He holds an external affiliation as honorary chief scientist at Vivian Sparks IT Solution. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, Dr. Zagokta is uh, specialized and expert in, uh, in IP security and today uh, we will uh, uh, have him uh, for almost uh, 45 minutes to 50 minutes uh, giving us this uh, uh, first webinar for communication society. Dr. Zagokta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. al Mutadi. Uh, it was a very wonderful description, and I take the privilege in uh, giving my first distinguished lecturer talk today as a part of IEEE C Society. So uh, I will be talking about uh, hardware security of C devices and uh, its its threat models, the defense mechanisms against IP trojans and IP piracy. So basically. Uh, these are some of the list of my recent journal contributions in the area of hardware security and protection. And I would handpick the, the publications marked in red to speak more about all of this. So as we know, at the heart of every consumer electronics device, we have a system on chip or a application specific integrated circuit at the heart of it. Uh, the design of every such SOC starts with a specification followed by integration of the multiple third party intellectual property codes in the form of schematic, or uh, you can call it HDLs, which would be further taken down to do further processing of uh, floor planning, partitioning, and layout generation, followed by transferring that to chip fabrication stage where it would be finally converted into something tangible. So 
So each of these stages in between, between specification and chip fabrication is vulnerable to external threats which needs to be protected against. So before I actually move into how to protect and what are the possible threats, let me first explain what is an intellectual property core all about. So basically an intellectual property core is a piece of reusable logic block or cell that can be used as a part of the system on chip design. So in the area of consumer electronics, uh, an SOC is used for low power, high performance and low cost design requirements. However, the main goal of having an IP core as a part of system on chip for consumer electronics devices is to maximize the design productivity and minimize the design time. So as I just said, an IP core is a reusable unit of logic block component layout design which is developed for licensing to multiple vendors as a building block of multiple system designs. So this IP core based design and manufacturing process uh, is actually quite vulnerable to threats when we talk in the context of globalization of design supply chain where there is a lot of intervention of adversity and external people. Thus it mandates protection of IP cores from, from very popular attacks such as piracy and counterfeiting even from the very early stages of the design flow. So what I've done here is basically explained the design flow of the entire SOC in a short diagram. So an IP core can come from multiple vendors which are, uh, which are all third party vendors and these IP vendors uh, will provide their IP cores that can be further integrated in the in-house system uh, by the system integrator by following multiple steps such as scheduling, binding, data path generation, followed by layout, and GDS, which can be then transferred to the manufacturer for chip fabrication. Now, in this entire design flow, the first part I have marked in red and called it as untrusted because it's the untrustworthy regime where a lot of external threats is possible and a lot of uh, hardware, malicious hardware alterations could be possible. However, once it gets to the system integrator stage, it's in-house, so the possibility of attack is almost nil. And once it goes to the manufacturer, it's again uh, almost zero. Of course, I'm talking of one particular type of threat model. There could be threat models also when the manufacturer is considered to be untrustworthy. But in this diagram, we are looking at an IP vendor which is considered to be untrustworthy. So some of the key challenges and uh, major issues when we design an IP core or the possible threats related to that could be ownership abuse, where there could be multiple usage made to one license. There could be IP piracy, which we are talking of fraudulent means through reverse engineering to get back into the design. The third type we are looking at is trust, that is whether the IP core is really doing what it is supposed to do. And the fourth one we are looking at is Trojans, which is malicious design alterations made to the system or IP without the knowledge of the design integrator. So let us look into the first IP threat model in the first table. So I have considered two possible scenarios. The first scenario we are talking about is where the attacker is the 3PIP vendor himself or there could be an adversary present in the 3PIP vendor house who would want to insert without the knowledge of the system integrator some malicious alterations to the IP design such that it later on when, when it gets integrated, it creates certain unwanted functionality such as leakage of confidential information, such as change in functionality, etc. So here the green marks are the ones which are considered to be trusted sources and 3PIP vendor is considered to be the attacker. Scenario two could be when the first two are considered to be trustworthy and an adversary could be in the foundry. So this is the first type of IP threat model we are trying to tackle through the uh, current research happening in the domain of consumer electronics and in the domain of uh, VLSI. The second type of attack we are looking at is from the IP piracy perspective. So first one was in the perspective of Trojan, that means malicious alterations could be done by an adversary. And the second one we are looking at is from the terms of 
an IP piracy where a counterfeit IC or co counterfeit IP could be made by an attacker who could be a system integrator himself. So in order to safeguard a 3P IP, what, what an IP vendor does, it basically inserts a watermark into the design so that he can protect his vendor ownership. And there could not be any duplicate copies of the IP that the SOC integrator can use. The second type of attack is the foundry where, again, if, uh, if the vendor, a 3P IP vendor, does not integrate a watermark into the design, it could be misused at the foundry level. So again, the vendor is trying to protect his ownership or is trying to prevent ownership abuse. Scenario 3 is looking at another context where the SOC integrator uh, would be using his user fingerprint and sending it to the 3PIP vendor in an encoded form such that the 3PIP vendor, who himself is an attacker in this case, would not be able to, would not be able to generate multiple copies of the same IP and distribute to multiple users. So you see that if the SOC integrator wants to, wants to safeguard his design, he would use a buyer fingerprint. And if, an, if a vendor wants to safeguard his design, he would use a vendor watermark. So again, the interesting aspect to look here is there could be a possibility of symmetrical protection as well from both ends. So let us go deep into the first type of threat models. So what is an IP Trojan, basically? So basically, an IP Trojan is a malicious modification by an adversary or a rogue element to an IP or IC. The two major aspects of an IP Trojan would be trigger and payload. The trigger is talking about how to activate the Trojan silently so that it starts to create some unwanted functioning into the system. Whereas payload is talking of what would be the effect of triggering. So in the context of trigger and payload, we will have some classifications of Trojans. But let us first look into the different types of Trojan from the point of view of triggering mechanisms. The first type of triggering mechanism is called rear value triggering. So rear value triggering is a type of triggering where a Trojan can be triggered through rear events or rear condition. And time triggering Trojans are those which would only, only be activated after a certain time interval. So that would mean that these type of Trojans are also called time bomb Trojans. That means they would be activated after a particular predefined time interval. So basically, where are these Trojans? So these Trojans are basically inserted in the third party intellectual property core, in short 3PIP. And they're mostly done by rogue elements or adversary without the knowledge of the system integrator. So how can we achieve Trojan security, basically? How can we protect our IP against Trojans, which can affect the functionality? So one type of method which I would like to emphasize here is dual modular redundant based method that is applied at the architectural synthesis stage of an IP design for consumer electronic devices. Well, there, there are different type of algorithms, different types of methods, processes to, to provide security. In other words, provide detection of IP core. So I will take some example to explain. So let us see an example. What I've done here is basically converted the C code of an FIR DSP block into its corresponding data flow graph that you can see in the diagrams. So dual modular redundancy, what it does, it creates two copies of the same data flow graph or of the same C code. One is called original unit marked by UOG. Another one is called duplicate unit marked by UDP. Operation one and two are referring to the first loop iteration of the total iteration count. And operation three and four are referring to the second iteration of the loop count. So what the first vendor allocation procedure to detect Trojan does is basically it creates distinct hardware allocation from two distinct vendors in the original and in the duplicate copy. As you see, in the first case, the entire, the entire operation one, two, four, they have been given as vendor V1. And 
the distinct version of that has been given in the duplicate copy. So 1 dash, 2 dash, and 4 dash are given as V2. This type of vendor allocation of hardwares to detect trojans can have different implications on the latency and hardware area of the, of the IP design. As you see, the TEDMR has, has been indicated at 45,080 nanoseconds. That's the execution or processing time to produce the output. And ATDMR, that is the chip area, IP area of it, is 13,064 AU, where one AU stands for one transistor. The second, the second allocation procedure assigns the complete vendor V1 to the original unit and complete vendor V2 to the duplicate unit. So this is another possible way of getting distinct hardware allocation to the original and the duplicate unit. However, as you see, it has a different implication, different impact on the area and execution time. The third type, what it does, it allocates one particular type of hardware assignment or IP assignment from vendor V1 onto the first loop iteration. That is, vendor V1 is assigned to 1, 2, and 4. And similarly, vendor V2 is assigned to 1 dash, 2 dash, and 4 dash. The last one is a bit different. What it does basically is it assigns distinct hardwares to each loop iteration. So first loop iteration is 1 and 2. So it assigns vendor V1 to that. And the second loop iteration is assigned to V2. So you have distinctness there. And exact distinctness would be there in the counterpart in the duplicate. So you would have V2 in 1 dash and 2 dash. And you would have V1 in operation 3 dash and 4 dash. So, so far what we, have, what we have seen, what we have discussed about is how to actually tackle IP security in terms of Trojan attacks. Trojans that are particularly, uh, that are particularly of the nature of creating problems in the output functionality. That is, it has capability to change the output functionality. How we can actually take care? We can actually have distinct vendor assignments for individual DMR copies. Now, let us move into another aspect of IP security, which is called IP protection. So this type of IP protection basically is used to prevent or protect against IP piracy, IP counterfeiting, reverse engineering, and uh, some sort of, some sort of uh, attacks, which, which is called as path sensitization, maybe. I'll talk in details about it. So IP protection can be tackled both at the higher abstraction layer, which we call as high level or architecture level. It can be also taken care of at the lower abstraction layer. Each of the higher and lower abstraction layers can protect an IP core by the following four methods. The first method is called watermarking. The second method is called hardware metering. Third method, method is called hardware obfuscation. And the fourth method is called computational forensic engineering. So I will talk about each of it in details. So let me start with watermarking. So as we all know, watermarking is a very popular terminology that is being used in multiple disciplines, starting from bank nodes, multimedia, images, and several other places. So why not try watermarking for IP protection of hardwares? In this lecture, what I would be doing, we would be talking about a method of watermarking that is able to generate a low cost solution during architectural synthesis based on multivariable signature encoding for protection of reusable IP cores. So the watermarking, though, is a passive mode of protection, can still serve as a final line of defense against attacks such as false claim of ownership as well as IP piracy. So let's see how it is done, basically. So you have an IP core. You pass it through the watermark embedder. You get a watermarked IP core. You extract the watermarking, and you, and you pass the signature, what you had with you, to see if the signature is present in the watermark. If it is, you are the owner. <clears throat> so a watermark in an IP should have one very distinct and important trait, which is not there in case of watermarks in images and postal stamps in bank currency notes, which is a watermark in an IP core cannot have minimum degradation of its functionality or performance. In other words, there is no degradation of performance or functionality change allowed. So that makes it quite tough. However, that's the challenge here. 
So a watermark has to be capable to identify the owner. It should be robust and difficult to remove. It should be resilient against attacks such as tampering. And it should have minimal embedding cost with minimal computation effort. And finally, it should be easy for the receiver to be able to detect the signature. And it should be easy for the owner to be embed to be able to embed the watermark in low computational effort. So let's see what I basically mean about embedding cost. So embedding cost is the, is, the, is the overhead that we are talking about when you embed a watermark on your design, on your IP design. So basically, the lower the overhead, better it is. So in order to have a low overhead design, basically an IP code can be generated through evolutionary optimization methods such as particle swarm optimization and bacterial foraging optimization algorithms, which considers minimization of hardware area and latency in the fitness function. Secondly, it should be resilient against attacks such as tampering. So of course, if it is a multivariable encoded signature, then def that is definitely more tamper resilient compared to signature encoding mechanisms which have lower encoding bits. Third is fault tolerance. So this actually refers to watermarking constraints that needs to be distributed throughout the design such that partial tampering may not be able to destroy the watermark in the IP core. And finally, watermark creation and signature detection time should be as minimal as possible. So in the current research, uh, the group, the, the research group from Hong, what they have used, they've basically used a combination of zero and one to encode signature in the form of additional edges in the colored interval graph of architectural synthesis. So basically, colored interval graph is a mechanism to find out how many registers or storage elements you would require in your IP design. However, the basic drawbacks of this existing method is that it is susceptible to attacks and compromise because it is only based on two different bits, 0 and 1, as well as the watermark has high embedding cost and high storage overhead. So this is what basically Watermark is doing to embed a vendor signature into the design. I'll quickly move back where I'll talk about the other methods before I get into more details about the watermarking. The second type of method that I would like to talk about is called hardware obfuscation. So this is basically an active mode of protection of your IP core. So what hardware obfuscation does basically is it tries to conceal the identity. It tries to conceal, camouflage the identity of your IP code in such a way so that it becomes completely resilient against reverse engineering attacks. So here, obfuscation can be of two types. The first type is talking about obfuscation from structural obfuscation point of view. And second is we are talking about obfuscation from functional or logic point of view. So structural obfuscation is basically talking about hiding the identity of the IP code in such a way so that the reverse, so that an attacker, when he tries to launch a reverse engineering, he would not be able to identify what the design is, thus making it more complex for him to launch any sort of attack. The second type of logic obfuscation that actually does not try to hide the identity, what it tries to do, it tries to lock the functionality of the IP code by inserting key bits into the design. Typically, the key bits would be very large in the range of more than 192, 200, which makes it extremely difficult for an attacker to find out what would be the possible combination that would unlock the IP core. One interesting part over here is that during logic locking or logic obfuscation, if camouflaging is also applied on the top of it, then it becomes even more harder because in amongst the given n inputs, it would be completely difficult to find out what number of bits are actually used for keys and what number of bits are actually used for primary inputs. Even if the attacker tries to get an idea and he founds out that this is the possible number of key bits of the IP design, it would be very hard to find out what would be the possible combination of the key bits and what would be the possible sample of the key bits. The third type of uh, IP protection mechanism that I would like to talk is called computational forensic engineering. So this is, a, this is a method that is based on digital forensics. In this method, what it does is that it tries to find out the actual owner of the IP without embedding any user signature or adding any extra overhead onto the design. It basically uses digital forensic analysis to find out 
what would be the rightful owner. CFE, in short, Computational Forensic Engineering, comprises of four major steps. So CFE stands for Forensic Engineering. So the first thing is to identify the feature set or properties of the design. Second is to extract the properties or features of the design of the IP under test, as well as the IPs that would be generated as a part of the end claimants who are trying to claim ownership of the, of the IP. Third step is called clustering. We would try to cluster similar properties together. And finally, there's something called validation, where we actually find out which IP core generated from a given HLS or RTL tool is completely matching with the feature set of the IP under test. OK. So let me get into more details of how to embed a watermark in an IP. So basically, we start from an HTML description of an IP code. We do multiple steps of compilation and transformation, followed by operation scheduling, resource allocation, binding. And then we put the watermarking constraints in the register allocation step, followed by the data path and control path generation. And finally, you get the watermarked IP of a digital design in the form of an HDL code. So basically, an IP can be represented in the form of a data flow graph or control data flow graph if it has loops involved. That's why we call it CDFG. So we schedule that CDFG based on the resource configuration. And we create a colored interval graph to find the minimum number of registers required for allocation. We then generate a controller based on the colored interval graph. And we sort the storage variables as per the number in increasing order. Once the variables are sorted, then the next thing is to generate a desired signature in the form of random combination of tuples comprising of small i, capital I, capital T, and exclamation, where each of these variables have their own encoding. The small i stands for encoding of the edge with node pair prime prime. Capital I stands for node pair even even. Capital T stands for node pair odd even. And exclamation stands for node pair zero, any integer. So I'll give an example. <coughs> I'm sorry. So the process of embedding watermark starts with building a list LK of additional edge pairs corresponding to the encoded values by traversing the sorted nodes. We modify the controller based on the created watermark. So let's say, take an example. We have a scheduled data flow graph on the left, which is scheduled based on three adders and four multipliers. The, the, red, the red lines stands for the storage elements indicated by V0, V1, V2, V3 at each step of the, of the operation input and output. So based on this, we can create the controller on the right, which is the controller table shown. For each of the six control steps, we can have V0, V4, V8, V11, V14, 16, and 17. That could be all assigned to register red because they don't have because they don't have any overlapping of lifetime. They can be all done through the same register. Similarly, the blue register would be done through V1, V5, V9, V12. The register green will execute or store V2, V6, V13, V15. And finally, yellow register will store V3, V7, V10. So this is prior to embedding watermark. So far, the watermark is not embedded. Now let's see how to embed the watermark here. So what we basically do is, as I said, as per, the, as per the algorithm rule, we first try to create a colored interval graph. So what is a colored interval graph? A colored interval graph is a graph where the nodes represent the storage variables that you can find from the scheduling. If I go one step back, you can see. This is the scheduling I'm referring to. And each of these, each of these storage elements are being indicated by nodes here, where the coloring of the node has been obtained from the register colors that we have got on the right side of the table. The edges between the nodes is only possible if there is an overlap in the lifetime. That means if a lifetime of two variables overlap, then there will be an edge between the same. Having an edge between two storage variables of a colored interval graph indicates that a common register cannot be allocated for storing the two storage variables. 
So as you can see, they're all overlapping, right? V1, V0, V1, V2, V3, so they cannot be done through same registers. That's why there are an edge between each of them. Okay, now let us take a desired signature of watermark. Let's take this seven digit signature that is shown in this table on the top, where each of these digits have their own encoded meaning based, based on the encoding that I had explained here, the four variables. And as we see, that means there would have to be an edge between storage that between nodes V2, V3, between nodes V2, V5, between nodes V2, V4, V2, V6, and so on. However, as we see in the graph on the left, all the edge pairs are already present except 2 and 6. That's the reason I marked them in red. So what we'll do, we'll add 2 and 6. We will add an edge between 2 and 6, which is this and this, right? So in that case, what we do, that means 2 and 6 cannot be executed through the same register. Now, if you, if you see the control register allocation table before watermark, you see 2 and 6 are actually executed through same register green, which has to be changed. So what we do, we will have to reallocate this variable V6 to some other register, because it's part of the rule of the watermark based on the encoded digits. So after embedding this new, this new variable, we have encoded V6 to register yellow, and we have encoded register green with variable V7. So you see V7 and V6 have changed their positions. So that is why this part has changed from green to yellow, which was yellow to green earlier. So this indicates that the watermark has been embedded here. Now, of course, embedding a watermark is not the only thing because you know this is what this was a small example if you take a 80 digit 90 digit 100 digit signature there could be a lot of overheads of the storage registers on the design so thus we need to optimize it so i will speak about design space exploration as a method of optimizing the number of resources of, for generating an optimal watermark so let us have a look at the entire system diagram so input engine comprises of the module library. It comprises of the data flow graph of the IP. It comprises of user constraints, the control parameters that will actually control how fast the algorithm converges to a uh, global minima. So the control parameters for particle swarm optimization comprises of swarm size, iteration count, acceleration coefficients, and many others. The DSC engine will actually work and will compute the area and the execution time for every solution that the particle keeps on exploring over its period of evolution. And the watermark engine is pretty much what I have just now discussed. We start off with a particular resource configuration that is denoted by a particle. We construct the control data flow graph. Then we construct the colored interval graph. We generate the original design. And we feed the, the signature that is a desired signature of the vendor into it. And finally, we modify the controller based on the signature digits and we update. So an optimization method methodology will have a particle encoding that will reflect a watermark solution of an IP, which is subjected to the hybrid cost function, which comprises of normalized IP area and IP latency. Uh, so that is what I have gen you know, denoted by this cost function here. So this cost function will evolve over a period of time and will finally produce an optimal low cost watermarked IP code design as a solution. Now in a watermark signature detection is also a very important step, which mainly comprises of reverse engineering and signature verification. So reverse engineering is just a word. Basically, you know, we don't need to do reverse engineering in case, you know, the watermarks are embedded inside register allocation or embedded inside steps such as scheduling or hardware allocation have to basically perform inspection of the designs. And once you have extracted the relevant information after inspection, we will have to decode the signature and compare whether the watermark constraints of the decoded signature match with the extracted watermarking constraints from the design. If they match, then that means that person is a real owner. 
So this method was actually compared for a watermarking constraint comprising of 15 digits. I'm just putting a, a, a partial result here for you to have a better idea of what it has achieved in terms of the cost. So as you see, after comparison with one, which is a recent uh, watermarked approach for IPs, we have attained considerable reduction in the final design cost of the watermark solution, which is indicated by this negative cost here, compared to one. We have also measured the probability of coincidence, which actually reflects the probability of generating the same colored solution after embedding the signature. So the probability, as you see, is quite low, which reflects that the strength of the watermark is very robust, and it reflects the strength of the ownership as well. Okay. Now, since you have spoken a lot about watermarking from the vendor's perspective, now let us look into another angle of IP code protection, which is called symmetrical IP code protection. So basically, the protection would be here both for the buyer as well as for the vendor. Now, in such a case, what we see uh, that, that a design, before it's actually going into the layout or fabrication form, it has to be embedded with the user fingerprint. It has to be embedded with the vendor watermark. So we call fingerprint for user, and we call watermark for vendor. Okay, so symmetrical protection, the main motivation is to trace illegally resold, redistributed copies of the reusable IP code. It protects against piracy and forgery, and it also protects against false claim, claim of ownership. The desired properties of signature for both our fingerprint and watermark are very same, that it has to be low embedding cost, it has to be resilient against attacks, it has to be fault tolerant, and it has to be adaptable to any CAT tool that we are using to make an IP and it has to have a low signature creation and detection time, and most important, which is it has to preserve the correctness and the functionality. So basically, uh, the solution I will talk in brief, because uh, there's a lot of details to this. So we start with the module library, resource configuration, and DFG. We choose the buyer fingerprint to embed, and we obtain the fingerprinting constraints corresponding to x, y, z digits, which are the three variables used for encoding the buyer fingerprint. Once we embed the fingerprint into the design, then we have to choose the vendor signature, which is based on the four variables that I had just explained some time back. And then we embed the watermark also into the design. Once the buyer fingerprint and vendor watermark both are integrated, then the modified IP design is actually processed further for creation of floor plan, layout, and GDS file. Okay, so fingerprinting uh, in the literature has been has been done through three different digits of encoding, X, Y, and Z, where X stands for a rule that forces an even operation in odd control step while resolving scheduling conflict. Y stands for forcing odd operation and even control step while resolving scheduling conflict. And Z stands for encoding the value of the node pair with odd odd in a colored interval graph. Uh, the watermarking method is very same as what I had explained earlier, so I'll not go into the details of this. But I'll take an example to explain better. So let's say, let's imagine uh, that we have selected these four, this uh, seven digit fingerprint, which is XX, Y, X, Y, Z, Z, and the vendor signature is I, 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 capital I, small i, exclamation, and capital T, where its encoded meaning is given on the right side. So if you have an unscheduled data flow graph on the left, so how can we embed a fingerprint into this is as follows. As you see, the first the first digit of X means assigning operation two in control step one. So that means we have assigned operation two in control step one during conflict schedule resolution. What is conflict schedule resolution? We are talking about scheduling three operations in the first control step, right? Where we have four different possibilities. That means you could have scheduled one, two, three, and four, but you only have three multipliers at hand. So out of the out of the four, which three you're going to choose to, con to schedule in the first control step would be resolved by embedding user fingerprint. 
So the first step says you assign operation two in control step one. So we assign two in control step one. Next it says assigning operation four in control step one. It assigns operation four in control step one. Y digit explains to assign operation three in control step two. It assigns control step assigns operation three in control control step two. So automatically what is happening is that the first operation has been scheduled in the first control step. So we now we have three operations corresponding to the three multipliers that have been scheduled in the first control step. Uh, then we have x which is assigning operation 6 in control step 3. So again we have operation, operation number 6 in control step 3 here. So that part of is also embedded. And finally we insert Z, which is, which has to be done through colored interval graph, which we'll just see. So, if you look into the, if you look into the colored interval graph, which is generated based on the schedule given on the right side, you can have a look at it. That V1 and V5 have been executed through same register, which is register green of an IP. However, the encoded meaning says you have to insert an edge between storage variables V1 and V5 which stands that they cannot be executed through the same registers. That means we have to have a different allocation of storage variables on the registers. So that's why this part is marked in blue. So what we do, after we embed the fingerprint, we try to swap or change the, the allocation of the storage variables to the registers. So now what we have basically is we basically have V5 allocated to red register and V4 allocated to green register. So you can see the difference between V1, V5 and V1, V5 here. So they have been now allocated to two different registers. So we have already been able to embed the user fingerprint here for the last variable, for the last digit. Once this is done, now the next task is to embed the vendor watermark. Now you see this is the controller design that, is, that has only embedded the user fingerprint but has not embedded the vendor watermark. So let us go back to the decoding table once and we see that these are the, these are the seven, pos these are seven possible decoding mechanisms that has to be or watermarking constraints that have to be embedded in the design. The ones that have marked in red are the ones which we have to take care because the other ones are already present by default. So inserting edge between V2 and V7. So if you look into this graph. V2 and V7 are actually not allocated to same registers, so we basically are safe. We don't have to take care of that. However, V2 and V9, if you go back, V2 and V9 are allocated to the same register and as per the rule of watermarking, they cannot be executed through same register because there is an inserted edge between them. So what we do basically is we'll try to change the allocation again. So we move to the next diagram and we see that V9 has been shifted from blue register to yellow register, as a result of which V11 and V14 comes onto the place of V9. If you can check, this is how it is. So this is finally that the controller table on the top finally reflects the register allocation, uh, register allocation details, which could be implemented through multiplexers uh, in the data path of an IP core, which contains both the user fingerprint and the vendor watermark. I will explain the results a little bit. There are too many numbers here. So we have varied the we have varied the watermark size by keeping the fingerprint constant for three different types of watermark constraint digits, which is 10, 20, and 30. You see that uh, there is a different implication on the area and latency because of higher the watermark size, higher would be the overhead typically, and that is what we are basically getting. Or it could be the same in some cases. Now, comparison of the symmetrical IP core protection in terms of overhead, you can look at it, is the overhead compared to 11 is 0% because we don't have any extra overhead in terms of area. And the latency overhead is slightly higher. It's in the range of uh, 3 to 5%. And finally, the overhead in terms of cost is around 2 to, 2 to 1%. But this is basically happening because our proposed approach or 
the method that I'm talking about is actually taking into account of embedding both user fingerprint and and the vendor watermark. However, 11 has only implemented vendor watermark. They have not taken care of symmetrical protection. So this is the only work in the literature that actually takes care of both. Now I will actually go back explaining a bit about hardware obfuscation. Okay. Now since we have spoken about watermarking, since we have spoken about computational forensic engineering as I said some time back, since we have spoken about uh, hardware obfuscation briefly, let us also try to look into what is hardware obfuscation from the perspective of an IP core at the higher abstraction layer. So hardware obfuscation, if one wants to employ hardware obfuscation to an IP core, then the designer has to transform the IP at the higher abstraction layer by applying successive layers of compilation and transformations. So these transformations could be in, in, in terms of applying loop based transformations, in terms of transformations such as redundant operation removal, there could be transformations such as tree height reduction, there could be transformations such as loop unrolling, loop folding, several forms of loop based and non loop based transformations can be applied on the, on the IP design so that it completely looks structurally different than what it is originally. It is possible that this type of transformations may lead to some extra overhead in terms of the number of operations. However, when you allocate that and optimize it through evolutionary method, the number of the number of op, uh, number of resources would be same. However, the sharing of the multiplexer and demultiplexers at the RT level might be slightly higher. But it's worth because you have you have given protection of your design against strong reverse engineering attacks with only a minimal improvement minimal uh, overhead of area. So structural obfuscation will try to hide the structure, camouflage the structure in a way so that it looks completely different, very hard for the, for, e for the attacker to identify what the actual design is. And the logic locking and the, or the logic obfuscation what we are referring to will try to lock the design by hiding the functionality, not its structure. So it will lock the design through its key bits and will only be able to unlock it when you when you apply the right combination of key and when you apply the right sample of the key key structures onto it okay so for example if there are if there are 100 inputs in a, in an ip core and there are around 20 key bits so which 20 out of 100 that sampling is very hard to find because it is camouflaged and number 2 once you find out that the next thing would be what would be the possible combination of that 20 key bits to, to actually unlock the design that is even harder. So in totality, this becomes completely completely difficult. So it would be a combination mathematically NCR times two to the power K, where K stands for the number of key bits, N stands for the total number of inputs, and R stands for the number of samples of the, of the key. Okay, another type of protection mechanism is there, which is called hardware metering. It is for passive protection. So this type of method, what it actually takes care of is tries to generate a unique serial number for every IP that is generated and these serial numbers are actually stored inside the EEPROM of the IP in many cases. So this what it tries to do, it basically tries to keep a track of the number of IPs generated or number of ICs generated to keep a track of the illegally resold redistributed copies. However, this method has been quite old and uh, it is not able to protect an IP uh, in an active mode. That means it can only detect an IP piracy, but it cannot prevent an IP piracy. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into uh, the closing slides. Okay, so, so we were here and we had spoken about this and uh, so basically, in, in today's lecture, uh, what we have focused upon is tackling two different types of IP threats, uh, looking into different types of attacks, starting from Trojan attacks for an IP, which is mostly done at the third party intellectual property vendor house. Second is we are trying to look into preventing or detecting IP piracy, IP counterfeiting. We have also learned about mechanisms to 
to combat reverse engineering attacks through the forms of uh, obfuscation. And finally, we have also learned about applying digital forensics to find out the real owner of the design by computational forensic engineering. So these are some of my uh, journal publications uh, in the area of hardware security and IP protection in the last two years. I have handpicked up some of them to explain today, and, and I hope uh, uh, people had been, been able to get some idea about IP protection research going on in the in the current uh, in the current domain. Uh, uh, so that's it. Uh, these are some of my references, and I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, many thanks for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Um, and now we uh, would like to uh, open uh, the time for questions and answers. Uh, if you would like to uh, have a question uh, on, on the right side, at the lower side of the, your screen, there is uh, questions and answers. So, um, feel free to type your questions um, on uh, questions and answers at the bottom right of your screen. So far, I don't think I've received any question, uh, did I? So far, no questions, uh, as, I, as I see from here. So... Um, Please feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, I would be happy to answer. We'll give it another uh, one to two minutes. Sure. Yeah, there is one question here. It says, uh, when advice passes from one owner to another, how can you, how can your security system assist with that? Um, okay, thank you for your question. So how I understand from the question is when a device passes from one owner to another, so basically if you if you want to protect your ownership, you would have to embed a watermark into your design before you want to pass it through another to another entity. Okay, that would be the that would be the best choice. Uh, if if you if you are if you are not comfortable with watermark, another option would be when you pass on your IP to another person, the best way of active protection is to completely obfuscate the design and then transfer it. So uh, obfuscation would completely hide the or conceal the structure of your IP so that there is no possibility of uh, of being able to find out. Uh, I hope I hope that was uh, clear. There's another question I have. Uh, are there any industry standards for adding watermarks to IP? Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think so. Uh, the current RTL, the current RTL tools, or the architectural synthesis tools from Xilinx, uh, Cadence, Synopsys, I don't think they have any uh, industry standard watermarks. However, uh, the, the the methods which have been which I have been disclosing or discussing today have all been uh, published in IEEE transactions. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure these would actually be, we are also in a process of uh, going for commercialization with uh, a company called Viversparks IT Solutions, which is working closely with Intel. Uh, we have got patents on this. So I'm sure this will be coming up very soon in the commercial market. Uh, the third question I see, could, th could this be an opportunity for IEEE standards? Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, this this would be available or not, but uh, surely, I mean, uh, since it's an IEEE and we, we, we are talking about very, very foolproof mechanisms, which have been demonstrated on uh, multiple chips and it has got brilliant results, so I'm pretty sure there, there would be some availability of that. Uh, I think one person is asking, will this talk be available later to listen? Uh, I think maybe Dr. Al Mutadi would be able to answer that better. Would this talk be available? Uh, yes. It, uh, uh, it is uh, recorded and will be available. Also, the slides as a PDF file will be available on okay. uh, our Consumer Society website. Okay, perfect. So this talk would be available, uh, as Dr. Al Mutadi uh, indicated. Uh, there is, uh, I believe, there is another question that just came as a chat. Sure. 
ha have the ID, I will just uh, add it there. I mean, it is uh, from. Uh, uh, I can see the last one, but uh, are there any more questions? Yes, it is here, and uh, I will. Uh, I will just pass it to you. Maybe, maybe you can uh, you can share the question. Uh, you can talk about it. Because I just don't see that here in Q and A. Okay, so it says uh, <coughs> have the IP vendors been open to water market? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, can you kindly repeat once? Have the IP vendors mm -hmm. been open to watermarking? How the IP vendors would be open to? Have. Have the IP vendors been open to? Watermarking. Well, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, when we're talking of the, when we're talking in the context of watermarking, it is, it is, it is their mandatory compulsion <laughs> to embed a watermark in the design. So I'm talking of the vendor perspective when I'm talking of watermarking. And whenever I'm talking of fingerprinting, I'm actually talking from the buyer or user's perspective. So if the buyer or user wants to protect his design, he has to embed a fingerprint or provide his fingerprint in an encoded way to the vendor so that when the vendor makes his IP, he embeds that fingerprint onto the design and then embeds his watermark onto the design so that there could be a symmetrical form of protection for both the parties, seller and buyer. Okay, thank you. Uh, in any way, I see that uh, uh, no questions uh, coming. Uh, so, Dr. Singhota, uh, thank you very much uh, okay. for your uh, uh, fantastic and interesting uh, presentation. Sure. And I hope uh, our attendees and uh, uh, listeners or uh, participants uh, enjoyed this talk. And uh, if you have any further questions, uh, please uh, send it to us by email, and we will be more than happy to uh, to reply to you. Sure. Thank you all. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Right. Al Mutadi, for the time, and thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for listening out. Thanks a lot.